Good morning. Welcome to the Hearts for God Worship Center online Bible study. And today we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And as we learned last week, Thessalonians was possibly the very first book of the New Testament ever written. The book that was closest to the actual life of Jesus Christ. And amazingly, that first chapter taught us about the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All in that first chapter. Also in that first chapter, we've seen a certain chronology. You know there's a certain chronology that things are going to happen in the future. Like, it's going to go like this. Uh, I'll die one day, you'll die one day. We'll enter a state of sleep. The Bible calls it sleep. Over and over and over and over. Now, many years in the future, after the tribulation period, after the thousand-year millennium period is done, God is going to raise me and you and everybody that's ever lived from the dead, and then he's going to judge us. And then we're either going to enter the holy city, the new Jerusalem, right here on earth, or we will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, we see this chronology right away in the beginning of Thessalonians as well. Although a couple things are left out in the first chapter, but they're brought up again in later chapters of this book. So in this uh, first Thessalonians, we see that Jesus was real. He was the son of God. He was the promised Messiah. He died for us and he was raised from the dead by God the Father. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the crucial starting point of our faith. Jesus Christ, the son of God, was raised from the dead. And there were people alive that read this letter from Paul that could have possibly met Jesus in person. It was only 20 years later. Then the Thessalonians, they heard this message from Paul. As you know, he spent three weeks in this town of Thessalonica preaching the gospel before he got chased out and persecuted. But in those three weeks, many people became saved and many Thessalonians received Christ and repented of their sins. They gave up their false gods and believed in the true and living God. Then we find out right away in Thessalonians that Jesus is coming back and we are waiting for him. We are waiting for Jesus to return. Jesus is coming back. Some of us will be alive when Jesus comes back and some of us will be in the grave. But as we're going to find out later on in this book, the ones in the grave will be raised up first and then the living ones will go up to meet him in the sky. Then the Thessalonians doesn't mention the resurrection of all people at this point, not in the first chapter. The resurrection of all people, which is mentioned um, by Jesus and by Paul and by the writer of Revelation. But it's not mentioned in the first chapter of Thessalonians. But he does mention the judgment that's coming. So we know we are waiting for Christ's return. And he's going to raise us all from the dead and he's going to judge us. And then we're going to be figuring out where we're going from there. If we're going to receive the gift of eternal life, that's a gift. If we don't receive that gift of eternal life, then we're going to die. The second death in the lake of fire. But hopefully you've received Jesus Christ in your heart. And when you stand before God, your faith and your actions will show that your faith is real. And you will receive eternal life with Jesus Christ and God the Father ruling here on this earth in the city of the New Jerusalem forever and ever and ever. So there was a lot in that first chapter last week. Now we're in the second chapter today. The second chapter, Paul is kind of defending himself and his ministry team, making sure that people understand that they came with the right motives and they were truly preaching the true gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, and that they had no ill intent and no ulterior motives. They weren't trying to get rich. They weren't trying to become powerful. They were just servants of God and servants of the Thessalonians. And they preached their gospel, which many people received. So that's what we're going to see a lot in this second uh, chapter. It's talk about Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians and what it takes to be a good minister and also what it takes to be a bad minister. So we're going to look at both of those things. Chapter 2, for you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God 
to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. So before going to Thessalonica, they had been in the Greek city of Philippi. And at Philippi, they were mistreated terribly. Everywhere they went, people were arresting them, beating them, stoning them, putting them in jail, torturing them, trying to kill them sometimes. But they still preached the gospel with boldness. Man, if we could have that kind of boldness. You know, we, we give up so easy. If someone looks at us the wrong way, we stop talking about Jesus. We've got to speak up for Jesus, not just for this gospel of Jesus, but for the teachings of Jesus as well. The compassion, the love, the non-judgment of other people. All right, so in the midst of much conflict, they were preaching this gospel. For our appeal, our, our appeal, the appeal of our preaching, the, our appeal is not like our personality, our wise words, or anything like that. Here's what our, our, our appeal is. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests of our hearts. That's one of the most important things to be a Bible teacher or a minister of the Lord. You've got to teach the truth of the gospel. You've got to teach what Jesus taught. You've got to teach what the Bible teaches. You've got to take the scriptures and bring it forth clearly and simply in a straightforward manner. I try to do that the best that I can. And we see a lot of people today twisting the gospel to receive money, to receive power, to receive fame. And they're speaking to please men, as it says here. We're, we're not speaking to please man, but to please God. I try to speak to please God. Some of the things I teach are hard for people to hear. They don't want to believe the things I'm teaching them. But I'm just teaching you what the Bible says. And I might lose some listeners if I teach what the Bible says, instead of saying what they want to hear. And, and, and encouraging what they already believe, the things that are mistaken and not in the Bible. But I'm here to please God, not man, so I'm doing my best to preach gospel right from the Bible. We're not pleasing man, but we're pleasing God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, not with a pretext for greed, God is our witness, nor do we seek glory from people whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we are gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Here he's using the picture of the feminine, the, the motherly, the, the caring mother, nursing her children. Paul's love for his new converts, his love for the people of Thessalonica, his caring, his nurturing of them, his feeding of them, the milk of the word of God, is just like a young mother nursing her infants. And we see that this is an aspect of God's personality. God is sometimes, like Jesus said, I've been like a mother hen wanting to gather her chicks together, but you would not have it. So there is the feminine side, the female side of the nature of God and of those who through God's Spirit, preach the gospel. Being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, my labor and toil, we work day and night, that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So the Thessalonians, they should have been supporting these apostles with their gifts and their offerings, because that's what the Bible teaches. In the Old Testament, the priests were supported by the people. In the New Testament, the preachers of the gospel and the teachers of the Bible were supported by the people. However, if there was a case where they weren't being supported, they didn't stop preaching, they didn't stop working. If they had to, they'd go work another job and support themselves that they may allow the time to preach the gospel. And that's the kind of situation that I myself have been. I go out and work my job, and I support myself so that I won't be a burden to anybody and I don't receive any money from preaching of the gospel. So I understand what Paul and Silas and Timothy were talking about in these passages. You are witnesses and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how like a father with his children, 
we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So now he's looking at the masculine side, the male side of caring and protecting and loving. He says, we were like a father with his children. So first was a mother with her infant. Now it's a father with his children. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. And that's the kind of love that a minister of the gospel should have. A minister of the gospel should not be based on money or ego or pride, but a minister of the gospel should be a humble servant who loves and cares for his people. And uh, I do my best to be that kind of person. I'm sure I don't always succeed. We exhort each one of you and encourage you and charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, one thing we see here, they're looking forward to the kingdom of God. They're looking forward to the coming of the kingdom of God. When God's kingdom will be established on earth, Christ is gonna return and he's gonna establish his kingdom here on earth. But he wants us to walk in a manner, manner worthy of God. You know, once you say you're a Christian, once you decide to become a Christian, you received a free gift of God. You received salvation. You received the hope and the gift of eternal life and you receive forgiveness of sins. But that doesn't mean that it's not gonna affect your walk, your life, your behavior, your words, your attitudes. If you truly receive Christ, you will change in your behavior and your words and your feelings. Everything is gonna change. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. So we know that. And in the book of James, he tells us, you know, you say you have faith, you say you'll show me your works by your faith, but I say to you, show me your faith by your works. So it's our works, they're not what save us, but they definitely indicate that we have been saved and have a true, a true transforming experience with Jesus Christ. So it's very important how we walk and how we grow in the Lord and the works of love and charity and kindness that we, we show to people around us. But we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God, which is work in you believers. So I hope when I'm teaching you today, you could hear these words of the Bible as the words of God. And don't just listen to a man teaching you or speaking to you. Ask the Holy Spirit, to speak to you. And you should, during the week, be studying these books for yourself and seeing what God has to tell you directly without an intermediary coming in teaching you. It's really important. And once again, we see they say, we thank God constantly for you. We, we read in the previous chapter that he was constantly in prayer for these people. And once again, he's constantly thanking God. Uh, Paul was in a state of prayer, prayer without ceasing always in communication with God, in contact with God, and praying for his sheep of his pasture and his fold, the people he had brought to know Christ. He was praying for them all the time that God would strengthen them and keep them strong and keep them in the faith. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Jesus Christ that are in Judea, See, first, the churches was established in Judea. That's in Israel. At first, the church was nothing but Jewish people. The whole church of Jesus Christ was Jewish people that got converted to become Christians. And they saw Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. But now Paul is spreading this message in Europe. And it's going throughout the whole world that Jesus is the Messiah, not just of the Jews, but of all people. Jesus was the Messiah and is the Messiah of all people, of all nations, of all religions, of all colors, all languages around the earth. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Now, when, no matter where the gospel was preached, people were persecuted terribly. When they were in Israel or in Judea, it was the Jews that lived there. So then, of course, it was the Jews who persecuted them. Now, when they go out to other places, like to Europe and to Greece, now there's a lot of Greek people there, and the Greeks are persecuting them. Paul is trying to tell them, if no matter where you go, if you truly preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ, if you truly live a godly Christian life, a Christ-like life, you will be persecuted. 
That's a lot different than this prosperity gospel. People say, if you follow Jesus, you're going to be rich and live in, live in luxury. This is not the teaching of the Bible. Jesus said, just as I've been persecuted, you too will be persecuted if you follow me. Follow in my footsteps. Jesus was persecuted to the point of death on a cross. The Apostle Paul and his friends were persecuted terribly. Why do you think you could follow Jesus today and just live in the lap, lap of luxury and comfort and never suffer any persecution? Well, chances are, if that's the case, we're not truly serving God. We're not truly walking in the footsteps of Jesus. His message is radical. His message goes against politics. His message goes against economics. His message goes against everything that makes other people rich and powerful. So the rich and powerful of the world do not like this message. So you suffered the same thing from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out to, and uh, displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come up on them at last. So anybody from any nation that's persecuting the gospel of Jesus Christ or persecuting the teachers of the, of the gospel, they are going against God and against mankind and they're going to be suffering eventually the wrath of God. Now, verse 17. But since we are torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavor the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come again to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. You know, the Bible does teach about Satan. He's mentioned at least twice here in this book. Satan as a real person, a person who is fighting against God and fighting against us as servants of God. Paul said he was hindered by Satan. Even though he wanted to come visit the Thessalonians many, many times, Satan hindered him. For what is our hope or joy or crown of blessing before our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? Is it not you, for you are our glory and our joy? The glory and the joy of Christians to know that we've shared our faith with others and that we've brought others to know Jesus Christ as their own personal Lord and Savior. Have you ever led anybody to the Lord in your life? Have you invited somebody to know Jesus Christ and took time to sit and pray with them and receive Christ into their life? Have you invited somebody to church who later got saved and got baptized and became a Christian, a follower of Jesus? It's the joy and the crown of the Christian life to be able to be used by God to bring others into the faith. Now that's the end of chapter 2. I just want to do a quick review of this chapter. I like to take verses in the Bible and turn them into a list. You can read through a chapter in the Bible like we did today. And there's so much in there. It's so dense with information. It's hard to really get uh, your mind around what's being said. So I like to take the verses and the ideas and turn them into a list. When you do that, it really clarifies things. So I made a couple lists. The first list here is what preachers of the gospel are not. A good, true preacher of the gospel is not greedy. Now these all come right from verses we just read. You might have to go back and review to find them. Preachers of the gospel are not deceitful. Well, that would rule out a lot of preachers I've met in my life. Preachers of the gospel are not impure. Preachers of the gospel are not in error. Why are they not in error? Because they're preaching right from the word of God. Preachers of the gospel are not here to please people. People, uh, preachers of the gospel are not flatterers. They don't go around flattering people, complimenting people, trying to get on their good side, brown nosing, buttering people up. Preachers of the gospel don't need to do that. Preachers of the gospel are not seeking their own glory and they are not a burden to others. We should have an attitude as servants. Now here's some things that preachers of the gospel are on the positive side. One, one thing, they're preaching the actual gospel. They're preaching the teachings of Jesus Christ. And they're preaching salvation through Christ and Christ alone. Preachers of the gospel are very purposeful. They've got a calling on their heart. They've got a purpose to their life. Preachers of the gospel are ready and willing to suffer and to be in conflict with others. That all happen, happens to me. 
So many things that I teach from the Bible, people don't like to hear it because it's not what they're used to hearing and it causes conflicts. Preachers of the gospel should be brave. You've got to be brave if you're going to go out there and preach the gospel. Preachers of the gospel should be approved by God and pleasing to God. Preachers of the gospel should be gentle and affectionate, like a mother, like a father, like a shepherd. Preachers of the gospel should be generous, and I hope that every one of you is generous with your time and your money. If you're not giving away some of your time, you're not giving away some of your money, then I would say you're probably not doing all you should be doing for the cause of Christ. Preachers of the gospel should be holy, righteous, and blameless. Now that one I'd have to go by degrees because I can't stand here and tell you that I am holy, righteous, and blameless all the time. Far from it. But I do strive to be good and to do right in everything. When I don't do right, I do feel bad about it. I try to repent of it and I try to do better the next time. But I do try to do good. Holy, righteous, and blameless. Blameless, that's a tough one. Preachers of the gospel are looking forward to Christ's returning. So we should always be looking forward to Christ's returning. Even though it's been thousands of years, we still preach the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We know that Christ is coming back. Well, I hope you enjoyed that today. Chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. We've got some interesting chapters coming up. You're going to want to stick around. Thessalonians gets more and more interesting as we go. So next week we'll hit chapter 3. And uh, take it from there. So have a great week. Be blessed. Get into your Bible. Read First and Second Thessalonians. Study it on your own. See what you think. God bless you. Have a great week.